Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and a very hearty welcome to you all. What a privilege it is to celebrate such a special occasion with old and new friends. 1999 is a very special year for me, as it marks my 21st anniversary. Yes, believe it or not, the original monocoque hull concept was first devised in 1977. Travel with me as we rekindle memories of the good times and disappointments we have shared since my birth. Landmines are among the most treacherous weapons used in conventional warfare. They strike indiscriminately and never miss, continuing to kill long after hostilities have ceased. The Hippo and Buffel troop carrier vehicles and their crew had to contend with these inhumane weapons daily during the South African Security Forces' involvement in a low-intensity border war in the 70s. It wasn't long before the Hippo and Buffel began to feel the punch, and eventually they could no longer be operationally repaired at a cost-effective rate. At the same time, the then South African Police Force had indicated the need for a special multi-purpose vehicle for use in Africa's infamous difficult terrain. Under Project Geisha, the Applied Chemistry Unit of the CSIR began research and development work and constructed the first monocoque hull in 1977 using a hippo body and Bedford components. They named it the Crocodile. If looks had been the deciding factor at this stage, the vehicle would never have been developed further. In 1978, the Applied Chemistry Unit developed a second prototype vehicle with a lower silhouette and better features than the Crocodile. At the same time, Arms Corps developed two Hippo Mark II vehicles, one with a chassis and one with a semi-monocoque hull design. All three of these vehicles used Bedford components, which later proved to be unreliable and underpowered. At the initiative of Colonel Bux Lombard of the South African Medical Services, the Chemical Defense Unit developed the Flossy Ambulance using Mercedes-Benz components. This eventually led to the production of 44 Rinkhaus ambulances based on Samuel 50 Mark I driveline components. The South African Police was operationally committed to the war in the then Rhodesia and the border conflict in Southwest Africa now known as Namibia. They were very conscious of the need for a replacement for the Hippo, which, owing to its instability, had serious shortcomings in off-road applications. General Pitt Kruger, now retired, introduced the concept demonstrator to senior officers of the then SAP and instructed Kurs de Vett of UCDD and Gus Modlin of TFM to develop a powerful vehicle, which was better engineered for production. A development budget of 30,000 Rand was arranged and the UCDD and TFM contributed a considerable amount from their own budget. The prototype was delivered in 1979. Obviously, a good design is essential in such a vehicle. So I was subjected to mobility trials in Pretoria and the White River region and was fitted with 1,200 by 20 tires. At some stage during all this activity, the first production order for 30 vehicles was placed and was followed by a further order for 155 to the company Henrid Freuhoff. The last 40 of these vehicles were built by TFM in the specially constructed factory at Olifonsfontein. Utilizing an OM352 natural aspirated engine and 1200 by 20 tires, we were produced at a unit price of 7,000 Rand. I was named the Casper Mark I. UCDD delivered all my driveline components, while TFM constructed my body and did the final assembly and delivery. Once Arms Corps technical personnel had been introduced to my production version, they suggested the prototype vehicle be upgraded with a turbo engine and 1,400 by 20 tires. 
This UCDD did at their own cost. I was renamed Susper to differentiate me from the production units. Kurs Joubert of Arms Corps conducted stringent operational tests on me, including mine blast tests with a CSIR. I must mention that my engine was running during these detonation trials, which proved that the monocoque hull also protected my organs. The report of this operational evaluation, as well as feedback from the Kufuk teams in Southwest Africa, led to several modifications. And from 1981, I became known as the Casper Mark IIA. Smaller modifications later placed me on Mark IIB and Mark IIC status. Operational requirements and mobility limitations in wet conditions, owing to the non-availability of a differential lock on the Mercedes-Benz front axle, led to the development of the Casper Mark III. Introduced in 1984, these vehicles were fitted with ZF axles, which offered a limited slip differential capability to ease the driver's task. A short wheelbase called Casper Dumpy was also developed and showed outstanding vehicle performance. Decision makers rejected this concept, however, because it carried two crew members less than we did. Besides the troop carrier, the SAP understood the concept of a family of vehicles to ease the operational and logistics burden and instructed TFM to develop a recovery vehicle, cargo carrier and fuel tanker called the Gemsbok, Blessbok and Daker, respectively. It felt good to know that I met all the user's requirements of mobility, reliability, mine protection against multiple mines, ballistic protection, bush protection, ease of maintenance and cost effectiveness. Besides my excellent protection against anti-tank mines, Another outstanding feature was that I could be refurbished up to seven times before needing major repairs to the hull. The cost per detonation and downtime was drastically reduced with guaranteed high operational mobility. I was not only beautifully proportioned, being 6.9 meters long, 2.45 meters wide and 2.85 meters high, but I also weighed a solid 11 tons. Enough for a wheeled vehicle to sustain the onslaught of anti-tank mines and still deliver excellent performance. I could travel at a speed of 98 kilometers an hour and climb 60% gradients with ease. My crew confirmed my exceptional strategic and tactical off-road capabilities. I was responsible not only for transporting a crew of up to 14 soldiers, but also for protecting them. My loyal nature meant my crew could always rely on me, even in remote areas where there was no support. I carried their 200 liters of drinking water and a combination of light and heavy machine guns from 7.62 millimeter caliber to 20 millimeter cannons. I'd also been fitted with excellent communication and navigation systems. No wonder some of my crew regarded me as an African infantry combat vehicle. Together, we made a formidable team, and the soldiers' morale was always high. Up until now, I'd been used in three major scenarios. Riot control situations, border war conflicts, and humanitarian mining operations. When my country went through a stressful transition phase, I played a significant supportive role in combating crime in South Africa. My height and interior volume enabled my crew to observe flashpoints for several days and then react quickly when necessary. I received several special features while performing this role, such as wire cutters, steel roofs, uh, window mesh protection, bush bars, searchlight and a public address system. My involvement in riot control and crime prevention has since been taken over by the RG12 Nyala, which is considered more acceptable to the public. Personally, 
I considered border war conflicts to be the real test of my capabilities. Mines were detonated almost daily, and I had to perform follow-on cross-border operations. Believe me, traveling through dense bush under the constant threat of landmines is no joke. Weather conditions were extreme. Summer temperatures reached 40 degrees Celsius during the day, and in winter, dropped as low as minus 10 at night. To make matters worse, we also had to contend with rain and marshland. Sometimes, infantry companies only advanced two kilometers in three days. I can recall many times when bridges had to be built with trees so that we could cross riverbeds. Sometimes the driver's judgment was not so good, and we had a hell of a time recovering a vehicle from the river. When crossing roads, my crew first had to do a sweep with detectors to minimize the likelihood of detonating mines before my friends and I could cross. My crew and I had to be tough in our encounters with the bush that scratched our bodies and the sun that burned us to a cinder. At night, the tension was palpable and the cold cut through us like a knife. But our hardships were all worth it in the end. When we reached our destination safely, we could look back proudly and share some emotional moments together. Ah, we were a great team. Of course, sometimes we did not reach our destinations in one piece. Because of my high level of mine protection and mobility in the bush, the enemy laid specific mine patterns with large amounts of explosives. They also set ambushes and used anti-tank systems against us. I clearly remember the day my crew and I were ambushed. A TMK-2 anti-tank mine penetrated my guts and the ensuing shrapnel caused extensive injuries which eventually led to the deaths of four of my crew members. This was indeed a sad day. The first South African police cusper to arrive at Sector 10 was immediately ordered to do a reconnaissance with hippo vehicles. It wasn't long before we detonated the mine with the right front wheel. My crew escaped with no injuries at all. This incident boosted confidence considerably and a message was sent to Pretoria to continue with production. At 101 Battalion in the then Sector 10 operational area, the Casper was first used by Colonel Tom Ferreira, from where the name TFM was adapted to Tom Ferreira's Men. The first 12 Caspers were allocated to his team. Casper serial number TFM 11666 had an interesting history with 101 Battalion and was known as the Devil's Cusper. It was the first Cusper of 101 Battalion to detonate a mine, and also the first to detonate two separate mines on the same day. In both incidents, the vehicle was repaired under operational conditions. Sadly, TFM 11666 was also the first Cusper in which serious injuries to my human friends occurred. On the day it happened, we were traveling through dense bush and drove into an ambush. An enemy soldier positioned above us in a tree fired a 60 mm SKS rifle grenade onto the roof of the Casper, which detonated at the commander's hatch, causing serious facial and chest injuries to some of my crew. One of them passed away recently. On another occasion, a fellow Casper was traveling at 80 km an hour when it detonated a mine under its right front wheel and overturned. One crew member broke his collarbone and another suffered a broken right leg. I also remember the day one of my fellow Cuspers detonated a double TM57 mine with its front wheel on a tar road near Alpha Tower. The crew was flung out and slid over the rough tar surface but only suffered minor scratches and bruises. A happier memory is the day TFM 11666 was painted pink and donated to the local creche for the children's playground. Undoubtedly, the threat my crew feared the most was the RPG-7 anti-tank weapon. I recall several occasions when projectiles penetrated my body from the side, killing the crew members who were in the direct line of fire. A wooden liner of 18 mm chipboard was later fitted to my interior to reduce the spalling angle of shrapnel 
and restrict injuries to the crew. We Caspers were doing a pretty good job, as we were tough, reliable, cost-effective and always willing to work. It wasn't long before we were being used in other roles. My cousin, Plofada, was used to breach conventional minefields, while some of us were converted into ambulances and command vehicles. <laughs> 